Welcome back to Booked Up. It's the last day of February, that time of year, which was first designated Black History Month by President Gerald Ford in 1976. But it actually began 50 years earlier in 1926, when Carter G. Woodson, who founded an organization now known as the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, proposed that the second week of February would honor Black history. The idea was to coincide with the birthdays of both Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Over the years, with the civil rights movement, the tradition expanded to a full month. Since 1976, every U.S. president has continued the official designation Ford began, including a theme for the month. This year, the theme is Black Resistance. To help honor the month here at Booked Up, for our February book club, we are discussing the letter Martin Luther King Jr. composed in April of 1963 from his jail cell in Birmingham, Alabama. Joining me are two regulars and two special guests. We have conservative attorney George Conway and book publicist Ivan Lett. Our special guests today are Dr. Bridget Baldwin and Jonathan Metzel. Professor Baldwin teaches courses in critical race theory and criminal law. Her scholarly work has examined the intersection of the Ninth Amendment and social movements, as well as the convergence of race, class, and gender on welfare reform legislation. She is a professor of law at Western New England University School of Law. Professor Metzel is author of Dying of Whiteness, How the Politics of Racial Resentment is Killing America's Heartland. He is also the Frederick B. Rensselaer the second professor of sociology and psychiatry and the director of the Department of Medicine, Health and Society at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Let's dive in. Hey, everybody. So thanks. Thanks for being here. It's a little bit unique this month, our book club, we are reading something that's not exactly a book. Um, it's, it's a letter. Um, I think it's probably been published in a bound volume before quoted, um, for years and years, but not officially a book. And I, and I just want to add that disclaimer because, um, last month, uh, when the, the January book of the month was the, uh, this special committee, report on the attack on the Capitol, I did get one listener criticizing, saying I was cheating. And so if you are that listener, um, this would be a good time to, you know, fuck off. Um, anyway, just kidding. <laughs> um, okay. So glad to have you all here, Bridget, Ivan, George, and Jonathan. Um, I've already introduced you, so you don't need to blush. Um, but what I'd like to do as we start talking about Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail is to ask you each, um, when you first read the letter, um, and how it, how it hits differently now in 2023. Um, so Bridget, or shall I say, Dr. Baldwin, can you give us a little context uh, for the letter and, and, and how, and how you saw it then when you first read it and how you see it now? Sure. And and I want to redeem you for the person who corrected you last year. There is a book. Um, it's called Why We Can't Wait. Um, I think it was published in like a year after he wrote the letter. So it, there is a book with the letter um, as a part of that book. So there you go. You've been redeemed. Um, <laughs> if that helps. <laughs> Thank you. It helps me so, a lot. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so, so. To give a little context, I guess, about what was going on, right? We were in the, you know, the height of the civil rights movement. It was a centennial year, right? I think the the, the letter was written in 1963, and Black people had been um, emancipated in 1863, so 100 years, and the progression of civil rights was very slow, right? Very slow. We hadn't had any federal accountability, and um, so in, in Birmingham, particularly, it was particularly uh, violent against African-Americans asserting their rights and, you know, lost promises and things like that. And so Shuttleworth, Fred Shuttleworth, who was the leader of the equivalent to the, the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Council, um, I, I believe it, um, 
that movement was called like Alabama mission for human rights or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so he solicited King to come down and say, hey, we need your help down here. You know, Alabama has the worst record of violence against blacks and they're, you know, all these broken promises. We want you to come down. And so King comes down with his nonviolent um, approach to um, advancing civil rights and with a particular agenda, which I don't think a lot of people knew that the particular agenda was actually to get arrested, to have folks get arrested um, and to bring national attention. Um, you know, and although the pivotal account of this event is probably um, the letter from Birmingham jail, it really doesn't get moved to the forefront until we have the children's crusade that follows after this. But in any case, he he volunteers to get arrested, um, even on the back of the fact that, you know, he might not be bailed out, even on the fact that I think his wife is, you know, giving birth, you know, even on the you know banks of a failed um, a failed uh, demonstration in New York. He he. Um, gets arrested and is be- being held in um, solitary confinement and and gets smuggled this letter and um, this letter that was published in Alabama, Birmingham, I think, Times. And when you say this um, letter, just to be clear, a letter written to him by clergy members. Right. It was written by, I believe, Catholic or Christian and Jewish um, rabbis um, to him, kind of a public statement about how they didn't support the active demonstration and that, you know, black people, you're disrupting, you you have outsiders coming in. And really what you should do is really wait, wait for the courts, go into court and do it the right way. This is not the right way. Um, and to be clear, so, so we're, it's April, 1963, as you said, he's gone down there, um, volunteered himself in this act of civil and, disobedience and to be arrested. Friday. Yes. Thanks, George. And, and, and the goal was desegregation, right? Is that kind of... Like yeah, that? The, the, he, they targeted um, desegregation and political or, or economic uh, uh, structure, an economic structure to, to dismantle desegregation, right? Because we get the 1954 case of Brown versus Board, and, you know, and we get the slow progress of desegregating in all aspects of life. Like and, all deliberate speed was the imminent right. of the day. I get you. Right. And and then you get Bull Connor and George Wallace, right? right? I mean, you couldn't have two better people, right? To, um, <laughs> right. And so, so what, so, what was that segregation today? Segregation tomorrow? Segregation yes. forever? Yes. Yes. So, so that's the backdrop upon which he, he writes that letter in response to these clergymen um, denouncing. And he, and he addresses, you know, I think four points that they make about his presence in, in Birmingham. I'm going to come back to you in a moment for your feelings, but just to circulate around, around our conversation. Jonathan, um, do you have anything to add about the context or your own interaction with this text as well. Yeah, wonderful. Well, you asked me first, like when I first engaged it, and I certainly, of course, read it a ton in grad school. Um, And I I wrote a book called The Protest Psychosis that was about uh, the racialization of mental illness, which Mm. this uh, this period of of King's work actually was, was incredibly relevant. Now, I'll just say, first of all, that it is an incredible just piece of writing by itself. And so I'm so glad we're doing this because it is it is. It is just a beautiful example of a kind of rhetorical argumentative style that honestly we just don't see anymore, which is empathize with your enemies as a way of putting pressure on your allies, um, Mm. which is really the rhetorical strategy that he's using here. But he does it in such, he's using the categories, like he was responding to a letter from rabbis and, and priests and clergy. And so this letter is incredibly rife with religious iconography and yes. examples and things like that. So it's just a, you know, by the end of the letter, you just think either you agree with King's position or you're a friggin' lunatic, right? It's, <laughs> such a, it's such a beautiful piece of argumentation because it's so clear and it does what we rarely do in the age of Twitter, which is it's not throwing shade. It's not doing any of our things we do now. It, it's like, let me hear what I think your concerns are. And then let me re-articulate these in ways that 
it makes me seem really sane and you seem like if you don't agree with me, you're crazy. So I just think as a, as a piece of literature for argumentation's sake, it's, it's important. Mm -hmm. Um, but then for my own work, I, I, when I was writing the protest psychosis, I was looking at the metaphors that King used because he actually also uses, um, mental health metaphors a lot of times in his writing. Mm. And it's the beginning of this phase. Um, particularly in his in his sermons now this um the letters from the letters um it's incredible how it was written also right he wrote part of it on a newspaper uh, that was smuggled out and then uh, some other pieces of paper that were smuggled out and then a pad of paper that was smuggled out so he's kind of writing this uh, let's just say under duress <laughs> um, and he and doesn't have the opportunity just to just to jump in like you don't, you know, right now, if you, I know he wasn't putting it down. He kind of wrote it straight through based on the date he got the first, the letter from them and the date he turns this around, but he doesn't have the benefit to look back at what he wrote four paragraphs ahead, right. unless he kept a copy. He's just going, and it all hangs together. There's not a lot yeah. of repetition. I mean, go ahead, Jonathan. I'm sorry. No, it's, it's unbelievable in that way. And I just say the last thing I'll say is, um, what he's doing is he, he's in a way in, in increasingly nuanced form, creating that moral and ethical foundations of, um, of, of the ideology of nonviolence in, mm. in the American context also. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's so important because, um, like I see it, the, what I use in protest psychosis is his unfulfilled dream speech, the last speech he gives at Ebenezer Baptist Church before he's assassinated. And he's basically empathizing with people who want to be violent, right? He's saying every person in us has a Dr. Jekyll and a Mr. Hyde. Every person, mm -hmm. we live with a kind of ethical schizophrenia and there's an urge toward violence and an urge toward nonviolence. And what's going to help us attain our attain our aims um, in, in a more viable way? And so in a way, it's just interesting to read that 1968 speech against this 1963 work um, in relation to like What's the role of breaking the rules? What's the role? Mm. And, and he's saying something incredibly radical in both ex examples. But what he's saying is what's going to get us where what we want in a way, what's going to further our aims more, but also empathizing with people who just want to burn some shit down, basically, or, or something like that. Like, in a way, it's very em empathic because he says, you know, every one of us. And he references in, in the 68 speech, he references... Um, you know, effectively Du Bois's notion of a double consciousness, that to be restrained is to be what it means to be black in America and walk down the street. Mm -hmm. But what he's saying is this is this is a strategy in a way. And so he's he's articulating strategy in a way that I think plays out over the last I mean, it's such a loss that we don't have thirty more years of King's writing to see oh. how this would have played out. But it really is, I think, a change in the way he articulates nonviolence in, in this sixty three text that certainly plays out in really, really important ways. I, before I ask Ivan to address this as well, when you say it's a different way that he's articulating nonviolence, do you mean the steps he said about direct action? Are they different steps or do you just mean the rhetorical devices through which he explains it? He embeds nonviolence in religious traditions, mm -hmm. uh, in moral traditions, in Judeo-Christian traditions. And then in my work, he starts embedding them in the history of psychiatry, uh -huh. right? This idea of, um, you know, a hundred years before, there was an illness called dropidomania, which was black people were crazy if they tried to run away from slavery and, and, and stuff. So he takes oh that history God. and he turns it on his head and he says, yeah, we all have schizophrenia in our minds. So he takes he takes the traditions he's critiquing and then he refracts them. It's really incredibly refractory what he does, mm -hmm. which is you think he's agreeing with you and really he's saying the exact opposite of your entire paradigm. Uh, and so I think that using that to to justify nonviolence as a means to an end, um, mm -hmm. like here he's telling people to break the law, but he's right. doing it in a way that is incredibly embedded in legal and, and religious traditions. And and so in a way, it's really how he's, how he's building the foundation under nonviolence as a strategy. Well, I'm going to return to you later about this medical piece, because obviously that's your 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 sweet spot, too. Um, Ivan, you can take any of the questions, uh, how you met this piece, what you're doing now, any anything to reflect on on it. Yeah, I think if memory serves, I first read this in high school uh, and the reason I'm, I'm doubtful is because I don't have a memory of really sitting down and engaging with the letter like I did this time around. Um, it is, like Jonathan was saying, a really masterful piece of rhetoric. 
And, you know, the idea that you would argue with what he is saying uh, really does make you sound like you yourself might be insane. I was instantly reminded again of um, the anti-racist activist Jane Elliott and the kind of work that she does. Uh, you know, she goes around and, and you know, speaks to crowds of white people and asks, OK, who here wants to be treated like a black person? Oh, that lady, that white lady with the short, uh, w- short uh, white hair who yeah. talks about the color of your eyes, that whole thing. OK, yeah, I know. Who you exactly. Mean. Brown eyes, blue eyes. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, that's to me what this letter is accomplishing, um, you know, asking the questions of, well, why should we wait when waiting is going to be never. You wouldn't want to be treated the way that black people are treated in this country. And, you know, I think think one of the biggest things that comes back around for me on this, uh, it it does have to do with uh, a recent book that I've been working on. And no, I'm not here to hawk my projects. Oh, but go Um, ahead. Oh, I will. Then. <laughs> um, it's called Stayed on Freedom, The Long History of Black Power Through One Family's Journey, uh, written by Dan Berger. Uh, he just published a piece today uh, for Time uh, called The Black Power Movement is a Love Story. And that word, or really w- lovingly, uh, which is what King uses, actually, and love several times over, uh, is really what stuck out to me uh, in reading this, you know, many years later. I had always, I I feel like this is perhaps one of his most quoted um, pieces of of writing as opposed to his sermons. Um, And, you know, those are the sorts of, those are the sorts of things that I pulled out and highlighted as I was going through, like, yep, I've seen this many, many times over. Um, But again, the whole context of, the letter itself was different for me when I really looked at it with the eyes of, ah, I know now more about the love that he's speaking of. Not that mm. I hadn't experienced the the sentiment, the feelings uh, of, you know, fighting for freedom, fighting against injustice uh, as an act of love. The, the emotional value was certainly there for me, but I don't think I ever would have put it into words myself as love. It's so interesting that you should say that because that's one thing I noticed. Um, you know, I read through it again today. I mean, at four today. And I also um, listened to an audible book of a reading of this. And the one thing I noticed was that passage where he says Jesus was an extremist for love. I had I had not noticed that. I'd noticed maybe almost all of this. So I think it's interesting how we're how we're revisiting that. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about, um, say Dan Berger's book, what was the title of it again? And how does he engage with this? Yeah, it's called stayed on freedom, uh, the long history of black power through one family's journey. And really his book is a history of the black power movement as seen through the lives of, uh, two, lesser known activists, um, Michael and Zohara Simmons. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so what he does is, you know, through tracing their personal story, he knows both of them. Uh, I met Michael, actually, which was wonderful when they came to town for an event a few weeks ago. Um, But he goes through their lives and gives us uh, a window into the ways that the Black Power Movement was formed in the 60s, you know, changed and, and under certain circumstances um, in the 70s, went global, um, and then ultimately sort of began to peter out um, really in the in the 80s, in the, in the advent of Reagan. Um, but an important thing to note here is that, you know, King himself, I think, um, in his drum major instinct uh, sermon, you know, sort of de-emphasized the idea of focusing on one figure in the movement, and in Mm -hmm. this case, himself, um, and being able to shine a light on the other members of, of, you know, the collective of the movement uh, who helped make a band a sound. And that's really, you know, what I think uh, King is, is getting at, of course, when he speaks about being uh, uh, an extremist for love or, or protesting uh, or breaking laws openly and, and lovingly because you're standing up to do it for 
not only yourself, if you are the one suffering injustice, but you're doing it in solidarity with others, others whose lives you may interact with directly and you know may see every day, but also people across the world uh, who suffer the same kinds of mm-hmm. injustices. But he also says, too, that that those laws are not laws. And and I think um, that's important, too, that, you know, it's not that, you know, I'm just an extremist for love, which he is. He He's also taking a stance to say that those aren't laws. If, right. if you enact laws that only one particular group of people have to follow and they have no um, help in deciding those laws, those aren't laws. They're, they're not laws that we have we should follow. Right. And I I think it's important that he notes that uh, a law can become unjust based on its on its implementation. Um, And I fully agree with that. And the whole process. I mean, I think one thing also I noticed as a lawyer reading it as opposed to an undergraduate is not just his definition of, you know, what is an unjust law in terms of um, the the nature of the law about how it treat how but the ap- nature and the application but also the lack of voting rights and not having had a voice in that that really hit a different a different way this time um, but let let me ask you George when did you first encounter this letter and how does it as someone who has been part of the conservative movement and maybe at one time I don't know if you still are but I don't think you're a member of the Republican Party anymore but at any rate how you think your party or the conservative movement has grappled with um, or appropriated um, King or, you know, just your thoughts personally and also as part of that movement? Like Ivan, I mean, I don't remember exactly when I read the text of it. Um, I do remember being familiar and hearing about it in high school, which was in the late 1970s. And that's what strikes me on reading it again and reading it carefully and reading it you know, with, in, in 2023, struck me about it was when I learned about this, and I certainly didn't read it many years after I was in high school. I was either read it in high school or in college. Um, that was 20 years, less than 20 years um, after he wrote it. We were, I mean, it was, was, was in the span of a, wow. a short teenage lifetime. And now... You know, it, 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 that's what it stuns me today that it still has that resonance because I would have thought that 40 odd years later, we would be in a better place than we are today. And that's just to me is one of the, the stunning things about re- rereading it. And also it's just, it's just, I guess it's, it, it shouldn't be surprising because it's, it's timeless. It's a timeless expression. And you say 40 moral, years later since, sorry, since 40 you years read it, since, but it's, since yes. well, I would have been exposed to it, right? Because yes. it, would have been, and it was I, written it would have been, 60 years ago and you'd think we'd right, be in I'm, a better I'm, place. I'm, well, now, yeah, no, I'm thanks for clear. reminding, thanks me. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me of my age. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, no, but it, it it's really, really quite remarkable that in, in this age where we are having these debates about what, how we should teach history, this, mm-hmm. there wasn't a question in the late 70s that this was an important part of our history. Maybe, maybe it's because I grew up in Massachusetts and they were more liberal there. I don't know. But there was no question that the whole, what had, what had happened, which seemed to me eons before because I was 17 years old and or whatever and I didn't everything that happened in the 60s was in black and white and seemed like a long time ago when it really really wasn't um, it, it, it it was there was just no question how important it was to teach and understand what had literally just happened in the United States of America and now, We've lost that in a way. We have people, you know, arguing, and this this ties into the question of, you know, modern day Republicanism, where who are who are like literally would question whether or not things this this history, the history of what happened in Montgomery, the history of what happened in the entire South, um, the whole civil rights era, you know, is somehow not important or overemphasized in American history. It's it's it's. That's what stun- that's what 
that's what really struck me. I don't know if I've articulated it well, but that's that's what struck me upon rereading it today. I mean, what's 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 new is in a way not old, and and what's what's old is not new, and mm. it, we are just it, it's it's almost like we just we're repeating ourselves. We're we're playing the same. We're doing the same things over again, and we're mm. you know th- this isn't this isn't. This isn't. This shouldn't be as hard as we're making it. I guess. Is what I I'm, know what I'm trying to right? express. I feel that way too. Because when I think about this, I think separate and apart from this letter, which I, I want to say something about, and it's gorgeous writing and how it takes us on this incredible historical, emotional, and rhetorical journey. Um, I, I also think that one of the most beautiful parts of American history is the history of the civil rights movement, and that I don't understand why this would anyone would think this should be a footnote or a separate course. I mean, I, you know, this is, I, I know that um, we talk about the 1619 project and to the extent that there's another moment in American history, it, it seems to me that this movement and this leader is the beginning of American history in a different way. You know, we, we don't, and uh, uh, Jonathan, you want well, to I, I just, I, I agree. I agree with both of you. I mean, it really is what, I just ironic to think, and I completely agree with George, even five years ago or 10 years ago, the, the thought that this would be controversial, um, and certainly before the Trump election, it was just unimaginable. Like the story, we had a progress narrative in our, story, in our, in our country um, that went from this letter to Jesse Jackson crying when Barack Obama was elected the first time. And, you know, it's kind of like we learn from the past and then we, and it's a, prog- a particular progress narrative. Um, and now we're sitting here thinking, like, could you even teach this letter in at least three states and probably more? <laughs> um, you know, you couldn't. Could you teach this in Florida right now? And so the idea that this is controversial um, is that there was there was as we were thinking, everything was a progress narrative. There was another story. You know, there was that Tom Stoppard play Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, mm-hmm. um, which was the story told by the, you know, Hamlet through the lens of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Um, this is, well, Bull Connor had a story too. Um, and that's the story we're telling now, which is American mm. history is, well, the Bull Connor narrative. You know, he, he was he was down, but not out. And and so we're still fighting this kind of thing. And in a way, the idea, the unassumed progress about uh, not just equality, but citizenship, Productivity, um, technology, all these things um, really is is in question now because the thing that we thought was defeated through stuff like this actually turned out not to be the case. That history is a pendulum, and we're rebounding in a particular way. You know, as you're saying this, Jonathan, I'm I'm thinking about how helpful it would be to have this letter, and I'll explain for a moment, in order to study the summer of 2020 and the uh, George Floyd Black Lives Matter nonviolent protests that were met with police violence because there's this conflation when in, in, when, when um, you know, sort of pro-Trumpers are justifying the violent insurrection, the attack on the U.S. Capitol, they're always like trying to say, well, look at the Black Lives Matter protests. But those were nonviolent resistance that met were met with police violence. And the idea of being able to kind of teach people the theory and what, when it works and when it doesn't in practice of nonviolent resistance. And to me, back when I read this, and again, I think the key, one of the key things that he walks through here is the purpose of nonviolent resistance to create or a direct action, right? Doing something sit-ins or blocking thoroughfares or making it difficult for commerce to continue for people to shop. It's to create tension, The tension may feel uncomfortable, but tension brings people to the table to negotiate. That's the purpose. It's not an end in of itself. And if you if you think about applying that lens to the protests around George Floyd, it was like if we do not. And by the way, we all know that was a a multiracial protest in various cities across the country. And the idea is if we do not put our bodies in the streets, even in the time of covid, nothing will ever change. Not that it changed that much, but it changed a, a little bit. And that how many years of police brutality, and I guess many more years, as we can see, does there need to be? And so that's why you need to have direct action. And you kind of look through this letter. And I feel that 
um, I feel that he he really does explain that. And I think um, I think it's really important um, to see. And I also think why this letter feels like a gut punch, too, is there's never an end to uh, the white moderate. What, you know, especially in the Democratic Party saying you got to wait. Um, Jonathan, you, you're signaling to me that you have a thought. <laughs> well, I, I just think before we get to the white moderate, I just okay. want to <laughs> say one last thing about this point, which is yeah. I also think it challenged us, us um, to ask if these methods are still effective. Okay. Um, um, and so I also think that there's a st- strategy. And the reason I say that is because um, because like this logic, King's logic here has also been used in conservative circles. Um, the logic of self-defense was used um, by the Supreme Court in the Bruin case to um, overturn gun laws in New York and other places. And so in a way, these this strategy, I, th- I, I don't have an answer for this, but I would also say that before we move on from history, mm. um, that I also think it challenged us to say, are these strategies effective? Or was it the fact that they were so radical in the 60s? Nobody was doing this in the 60s. <clears throat> and now this it's kind of like MLK Day itself in a certain kind of way. It's been so, it's been so, um, it's become so, you know, the the meaning has been changed because it's been taken up by a lot of white people, basically. I was trying to think about political when I say that, but that's what I mean. Um, I've been so, nodding, and so I'm yeah. going to let him talk. <laughs> the word is whitewashing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. And so this this language and this logic is now used to justify a bunch of stuff that King would never agree with. You know what I mean? Like, And so... And so the well, can I break is, that the, down? Are you saying, yeah. so I guess there's a bunch of stuff. There's one, is it even, does direct action even create the necessary tension to bring people to the negotiation table, negotiating table to make change, one. And two, um, is it even effective because it's been appropriated by dominant culture? Is that, is that what you're kind of saying? I just think it's important to know that when this was being done in the 60s, nobody had ever done this before. It was mm. completely radical. I mean, they had, of course, and, you know, Gandhi and all that stuff. But I'm saying in the U.S., to meet hate with love was, was was you know, and I just think that in a way, this message has been commodified in, in a certain kind of way. And so I guess the question is, if you did if you did the same thing now... Or do we need new tactics? That's my question. Bridget, I don't have you, an answer. You're jumping in. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, I think I think that the the part of it is that it's direct action along with right media presence, right? So if you think about it, it took the images of the high schoolers being mauled by dogs and and hoses to get mm, the nation right. and the world to take notice, right? And it took the killing of George Floyd on camera to get the world to take notice. Um, I, I like the word that Ivan used, whitewashing, because King King and his speeches have been whitewashed, right? He was really a socialist, right? His favorite author, I think, was C.R.L. James, um, and he believed in labor uh, movements. And and I think what we allow conservatives to do is to control the narrative. And when we allow them to control the narrative, then you get this other thing that functions in a way that we didn't intend to do, like, like reverse affirmative action and stuff like that. Um, I think also that What the speech does for us today is it it highlights the persistent struggle that we have with police, right? We have Will Mm -hmm. Connor, who's the head of the police force and and the police force, the militarization of police forces now. And so it, it, it highlights the struggle that we have with police and the significant role that police play in stamping down whatever social movement there is, whether it's, you know, Black Lives Matter or the civil rights movement. And we have a long history of criminalization of constitutional rights. That's really what we're looking at, right? The criminalization mm-hmm. of, of constitutional rights, different freedoms and, and, and that we're looking for. And then that the front line is just criminalization. I want to just jump in and read just one passage because it feels like a violence to talk about his work without voicing it. <laughs> so gorgeous. Let me just read something because it relates to what you just said, Bridget. Um, and this is kind of in the part of the letter um, where he's talking about um, 
Socrates and civil disobedience and the Boston Tea Party being a massive act of civil disobedience. And he says, um, and this is kind of why, uh, why we can't wait. Um, but when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Funtown is closed to colored children and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness toward white people. Yeah. Well, we I can't mean, wait. <laughs> still the story. It is. I mean, it is a different experience to walk down the street in this country. Um, and I think one of the most difficult but important things is being able to recognize that someone else's experience is different than your own. Um, that is not to say that they should be, that, you, that one person should be treated better uh, or, you know, receive more privilege in a certain kind of way, but we are human beings. We are discerning creatures. Uh, we have to find some way of being able to acknowledge coexistence. I think I think it's also pointing to the fact that it's easy for you as an observer to sit back and wait and sit back and ask us why why we shouldn't wait for the, the progression of the court systems or for our rights to eventually come. It's easy because none of these things are happening to you. And if you had to undergo these things that were that I'm enduring or my people or my culture, whatever the case might be, then you would see why why we can't we have to do something to draw attention to make this happen much quicker. You mentioned it's so interesting um, when he talks about his daughter. The next thing is about his son as well. Um, I think he says something like uh, and then having to explain to my son when he asked daddy why are um, white people so mean to us or, or, or something to that effect. Yeah, why do they hate us? Yes. What, it, it just any parent um, or anyone who's been a child knows what that is. You mentioned at the beginning, Bridget, that his wife was maybe about to give birth again at that I, time. I, or Yeah, I think at the time um, that he was down in Birmingham, she was actually giving birth or had just given birth to their fourth child mm. um, because that that was a big deal about him being there and being isolated from her and her not knowing, is he alive? Is, you know, is he safe? And let me let him know about the baby and things like that. Yeah. What well, to me, when I also look at this letter and I think, OK, this is 1963 and we know in five years what's coming for him, which he obviously always knew was waiting um, that potential of an assassination. Um, but I'm also thinking of... Um, you know, the, in the letter, um, it, sorry, in the, the the letter that was written to him from the clergy, they were saying, you're saying you're advocating nonviolence, but you're stirring people up and there will be violence. And, you know, it reminds me of, um, you know, Spike Lee's film from the 90s or uh, Do the Right Thing. Is that the 90s? You know, in this sort of tension between you, you can, you can, you know, the Malcolm X discourse versus um, the MLK discourse. In this moment, you know, for those, spoiler alert, you should see Do the Right Thing. But I'm just going to tell you this. Okay, this is now, you know, you know, fast forward like a minute or something because I'm going to talk about the ending. But there's a moment. Have you all seen that movie? Okay, good. Um at the ending where there's this guy making this decision, you know, it's in a city uprising and trying to figure out what to do. And there's this moment, is he going to take the nonviolent path? And he's got this garbage can or something and he just throws it through a window. And you can understand it, though. It's not the best choice, but you can understand that. And so I wonder how we how do you read this letter in 1963 in, in, in light of Watts and in light of the uprising in Detroit? I'm from Michigan, so I'm always bringing back things back to my state. Um, and, you know, I think some of that stuff was inevitable. Um, and I think the so-called white flight 
blaming it on the, you know, quote, riots um, was inevitable because that was a form of for, for choosing segregation. But I don't know. I, I don't know how I guess I'm throwing a lot of stuff in here about are. the inevitability of violence. Lost. George. Sorry, yeah, George. No, you I mean, can, I, what you what you just said and what Bridget just said a few minutes ago to me dovetail. I think that I mean, the things that made this letter, what made this letter so effective, apart from just the brilliant rhetorical construction of it, um, what made it effective was the response to it, the, the, what, what was the violent response to it, and, and the fact that it was on television and you could see it and you could see what the, you know, you could see the, the fire hoses and the dogs and you could see all of that. And then the moral clarity of the letter. And mm -hmm. in a sense, to go to what you just said, Jen, the eight clergymen he was responding to, that King was responding to, weren't wrong in the following sense. There was a potential for violence. What this nonviolent, these nonviolent actions, the sit-ins and the marches, were quite likely to trigger violence. And their point was, that's why you shouldn't do it. But that's also what made it effective. Because he, in a sense, I'm not going to, not suckered, but he showed the Bull Connors of the, the, to the, to the, to the American public and to the world, he showed everyone who these people were. And he right. did that, you know, by, by, we're just, you know, we're on, we're nonviolent, but look what they do to us. Mm -hmm. And, and, right. and that was, that was really what, one of the things that made you know, that's why this the, the, the letter became so powerful after it was written. It was after people had seen all these images. And then, mm. you know, you go and you read the letter and to talk about, you know, uh, uh, Jonathan talked about how it was constructed. It's brilliant. It just it sucks you in. Uh, you know, I, he he's empathizing with the pastors who actually empathize with his cause to some extent. And he praises them for that. And then he works his way into the, you know, rebutting points methodically with short sentences. And then he goes into this long peroration where the, where the, where the sentences are like 500 words long, talking yeah. about all the things that were done to people, mm. including his daughter and his son mm -hmm. and everyone else. So the power of it really is the contrast between, you know, he, the, the moral, the sharp moral contrast between the fire hoses and what, what he's expressing. And um, I think what, I, I think that's, that's the story of this letter. Right? I also think that we would probably be naive to think that he didn't think that his nonviolence approach would bring violence, right? Because they prepare for that as one of their um, tenets, right? Right, you know, the, clear, the, hit, the right? purification, right? Right. Sorry, right. go ahead. Sorry to cut you off. No, 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 no. I couldn't think of the word anyway, so I'm glad you said it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, he, he goes through this notion that, you know, you're going to be, you know, bit and you're going to be hit and you're going to be spit on and you're going to, and you have to be able to take it. So, so I think we would be delusional really to think that he didn't expect that th their mere existence provokes violence. Their mere existence, the mere fact that we are asserting something. I mean, it, it, you know, I teach this letter, actually, the, in criminal law. Um, and so we talk about, you know, the whole approach to, you know, unjust laws. Right. But it was their mere existence, their mere existence, you know, not not um, or fighting against the status quo, which would you know, incite the violence itself. And, and so he knew that and, and he was very prepared to accept that and engage that. Mm. So and that's the lesson for today. That's part of the lesson for today. I mean, the question earlier was whether or not um, this methodology, this approach, the nonviolent protest approach, um, Dr. King's approach has meaning today, even though it's co-opted by other people with other causes. Um, I think, I think there is, you know, there is a, there are, you know, there are other morally justified causes where you, where this is the right approach, where this has to be the right approach, because we don't want people to engage in violence to affect their political ends. And, you know, I think that it, it, he kind of created a sensible rule, sensible rules of engagement here, um, 
in the, in, uh, uh, for, for, for nonviolent protest. I mean, you have to be, first of all, you have to have a just cause, right? Or at least one that you truly believe in. That's not, you know, that, that you, that you believe in. The second is you, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're that the very law, you're breaking the very laws that you say are unjust. I mean, you know that that's one used in the sit-in and the counter. That's that's that that would count there. But also, it would mean you know lying down in the, in in the street um, to draw attention to the merchant next door. Um, you know that's you know, there's, 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 the, 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 the state absolutely can say don't lie down in the street. Um, but you, if you're willing to face the consequences of being arrested for violating that law, which you indisputably did, there's, you know, you're, you, have the, you, you have morality on your side as long as you are not yourself causing harm. And I think of this, for example, like, you know, you have protesters at the Supreme Court, right? It's not, it's illegal to lie down and park yourself <laughs> in the, um, you know, on the, on the plaza of the Supreme Court. And different people do it for different reasons. If you, you know, some people do it with coat hangers that say, you know, they're, they're, they support Roe. Other people did it with you know, might do it with with pictures of fetuses to say that they 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 they're against abortion. Um, but if you're willing to sort of take the consequences and and not and you're not causing harm, like you're not, for example, you're not lying down in the in the driveway of an emergency room um, ambulance entrance to protest the hospital's wage you know wage policies or something and you're you're doing it and you're co- and you're not engaging in violence yourself and you're not harming anyone and you're willing to take the consequences face the consequences the legal consequences of violating a law even if it, the law is otherwise just like you know you can't lie down on the street um, that's 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 okay that's morally okay and let me oh, again, sorry, that was that was completely novel. That was absolutely, as mm-hmm. I think, as 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 as, 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 as someone was pointing out, was, that, that was absolutely novel. And now we kind of accept it as as sort of like, yeah, that's right. That's that's exactly how you're well, supposed to do it. I don't know if that jump, made, maybe that made no, sense. No, it totally I, it totally made it totally made sense. And something you said about a just cause made me think two things. One, just to repeat, what he says in the letter is. In a nonviolent campaign, there are four steps. The first is collection of the facts to determine whether injustices are alive, then negotiation, then self-purification and direct action. And as we said, self-purification to him meant make training on not reacting if you are attacked. Now, I was thinking as George was talking about, you know, when it's appropriate, when it's not, I was thinking recently of the ways in which some direct actions can undermine your cause. For example, those teenagers who were throwing soup on paintings in, in museums um, because the pa- because the museums were funded by big oil interests yep. and they were trying to but draw that's attention. That's destructive, though. That's well, hold destructive. on. They're trying to draw attention to climate change and they're yeah. saying it's not destructive because there was plexiglass on the paintings. But it's uh, idiotic because what they were trying to draw t- attention to was why do you care more about this painting than the planet? And it's just kind of like... Um, it just, it, it's making people, it's forcing, it's detracting, I think, if you do certain kinds of direct action where you're trying to tell people um, something that's valued like art or what have you needs to be subordinated to something else, you're, you're muddying, I think, sometimes up what your, your cause. And so I think at the heart of this is, one thing I don't think he's mentioned is uh, not just deciding whether there's an injustice, but deciding whether the direct action is what I narrowly tailored. No, <laughs> is is tied to um, tied to the injustice enough that you're not distracting or adding another factor that's going to alienate people who might otherwise support your cause, Jonathan. Well, I, I think that's important because that's another point of comparison, right? Is it we've said moral clarity a number of times in this conversation, mm-hmm. and I think mm-hmm. it, um, and I think that um, I guess one of the questions I keep thinking is: Is it possible to have moral clarity in the present day? Um, like in the present day, it would be tweets from the Birmingham jail <laughs> and half, half the people Sorry, would be, that's just so horrific, but go ahead. And, and, and half the people would be supporting it. And there'd be a powerful counter narrative that half the people would be whatever. So the idea that there's one, that, that, that you can create the kind of distinctions right now is so complicated because mm. in every single thing, um, there's like nine, you know, the, the idea of having this kind of clarity is hard. And then of course, another important distinction in the present day is just, um, the perception of violence is coded 
as violence, right? I'm thinking about stand your ground laws, for example. Um, so in a way, just the idea of feeling threatened, which is something, of course, that DeSantis is doing and other people. So the idea that basically there's a distinction between violence and nonviolence is much more complicated in the present day. Oh. Um, um, I see what you mean. And so in a way, it's just that, that, uh, that when I said before, did I, did I think the strategies would work or not? It's just that the, the category of of moral clarity versus the, the good guy versus the bad guy, it's just much harder in the age of, of, of social media um, and our perception of what nonviolence means. I mean, I, I always think about stand your ground laws um, because the, in a way they're the precursor to... Um, can you elaborate a little bit? Because I, I can unpack in my mind what you're saying, but can you kind of stretch out um, how stand your ground laws have, have um, blurred the distinction between what it means to be nonviolent or violent? The, the, it's a very racialized sense that the perception that you're being threatened is leads to justifiable violence, right? So in Stand Your Ground, the idea that someone might threaten you leads to a justifiable means of, you know, even if the person just has Skittles. Like Trevon Martin with Skittles, yeah. just by being a, a young black man was a threat, therefore you can kill him. I'm not saying right. that, but this is, that was the, that worked. That, I mean, that is the logic of stand your ground, right? The perception yeah. of violence. And, and, and you know, not, it's not exactly the same thing, but um, the perception of being threatened or critiqued in a, a school in Florida right now is leading to, I mean, there's a lot of things about th- things being perceived as violent if they're racially coded um, that is just so different right now. It, it's really so different and it's not a pro- progress narrative, unfortunately. And so I just think that that um, it's important to think about what nonviolence means in the context of America right now, and it's just a it's just a it, it's potentially it, it's it's not the clear line that it used to be mm. in a way. Is part of what I'm saying, Ivan? Yeah, and much to that point of <clears throat> excuse me of you know sort of the distinctions being uh, complicated and at this point going back to what George was saying, you know. We don't want people to accomplish their means through violence. There's a little bit even further of a separation you can draw there between what is physical violence, uh, which is for the most part what we've been talking about, but there's also legislative violence, uh, you know, outcomes that affect people's health, their livelihoods, uh, their ability to live. And that often does result in, in physical harm. And so, you know, it, it feels as though Nonviolence would still have to stand as the only counter to even legislative violence, uh, in, and and you know certainly with ter- the determination of unjust laws. But it's not working in the same way anymore, uh, and it's not curbing the kind of of legislative push uh, to you know either disenfranchise or reduce access to you know, in, in any number of, of services, um, what else could possibly be done uh, other than nonviolence? Is that a rhetorical question? I, I, I wish it were. Um, I really want there to be an answer that is not violence. Um, but it, it, it feels as though if we're continuing to constrain the efficacy of nonviolence, who knows? I mean, I guess, uh, Bridget, go ahead. You know, so much to unpack and all this. I had to like write down notes as you guys <laughs> were talking. Um, because I think that, you know, he, even in the letter when he writes in response um, to him being, I think, called the, an extremist, he talks about, hey, I'm the mediator. My nonviolence approach is the mediator because you have those who are complicit, who benefit from segregation. And we got the black power movement going on here. And I think it's funny to look at nonviolent approach of um, demonizing the victim, so to speak, right? So you're looking at uh, black people as victims, victimization, and talking about their approach as opposed to what they're responding to. And I think it's important to continue to include what they were responding to in, in an analysis of a nonviolent approach. Also, 
I don't think that a nonviolent or my approach to how I want to address my my grievances should be defined how you or society thinks I should address my grievances. Right. Because I'm the one who's in that grievance and you're not. And it might not be important to you whether or not I can sit at a lunch counter because you can or it might not be important for you for these other things because you can. The other thing is that I don't think we should discount a lot of the black power movements, um, Malana Karanga's movement, uh, Black Panther Party. They, they fought for they initially started out as a self-defense organization. And so the violence that we couch them within is it should be couched under this umbrella that, hey, we're defending ourselves. We're not proactive with violence. We're defending ourselves. Yeah, I mean. All of that is a good point. I guess I'm stuck on, I want to hold some space for this idea that we don't know the ways to accomplish our goals. Assuming that we all share the same goal, let's just say for a moment that we all believe in equal opportunities and even inequality of outcomes. I mean, a fair society, you know, for um, shared prosperity, multiracial democracy and all of that. Um, and I, I also, though, now want to kind of turn to, as we start to wrap things up, um, the problem of the white moderate as he saw it, which we did touch on it a bit, and also, Jonathan, in particular, your more recent book, Dying of Whiteness, and how that means for me, it doesn't bode well for um, for the average white person, I don't even know how to say that, for the typical white person to share the same goals that we might all share in this conversation. So if people are willing to die um, before they share prosperity or access to health and all these things with people they don't want to share it with, what will possibly work? I mean, the, the critique of whiteness and of and of the moderate white in this 1963 letter is really, it's just incredible, honestly, that somebody wrote this in 1963 because he wasn't just saying, he, you know, basically what he was saying is, Bull Connor, I know where he stands. KKK people, I know where they, where they stand. People who say they're allies with us, but then don't show up. Those are the people that I find much more terrifying. And so in a way, it was a it was a critique of virtue signaling in, in a certain uh. kind of way. It was a critique of uh, not just the obvious white people and the kind of good, bad binary that we've been talking about. But mm -hmm. so the fact that he kind of works that in over a couple paragraphs um, that really I know where I know where my enemies stand. But where does my friend where does my friend stand um, is a pretty deep point. I think it's a pretty deep point that really ties to this question of kind of how how far are people willing to go? Um, and and I, I certainly saw that when I was researching my book, Dying of Whiteness, particularly around gun policy. Um, you know, it was really interesting interviewing people around gun policy because a lot of people were like really openly toting guns and they were very, you know, um, a Mr. Gangbanger might come and carjack me or something like that. And that's why my AR-15, it was, it was like, I mean, it was scary, the guy had an AR-15, but it was kind of like a predictable stereotype or things like that. But then there were other people who like told me up and down, like, I'm against, I'm against gun rights and I, we shouldn't have all this stuff. But then I looked at the data and like a lot of people, like a lot of white moderates, for example, wouldn't vote um, against, against gun policy. There were all these ways in which people were really good at signaling, but they weren't good at like really instilling the institutional change that was needed. Mm -hmm. And so rereading this too, I guess that's another kind of rhetorical question is his critique of, of white, of white allies. How, how much does that hold true also? Right. Um, and, and I think it's, it's still a challenge, right. That, uh, that we, we can, we can shout out the bull Connors on social media, um, uh -huh. But really, the question is, what are we all playing in, in creating that world that, Jen, I think you're right, we want, we want to get, get toward? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think more people, <laughs> more, more white moderates need to read letters like this. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think it, it kind of um, invites the question of the now what? I mean, I think we're all we're all looking at this, you know, it's gorgeous. It's um, he was an incredible leader. And I think about, you know, who is, you know, who is an equivalent 
voice today, you know, someone who is outside of government, but a thought leader. Um, any, any ideas on who you think is, and I don't mean copying him or doing what he's doing, but who is another leader who is pushing toward goals of social, racial, and economic justice, who you think will be looked back on, hopefully in 60 years where we don't say, oh, we've backslid, but has been effective in moving things forward. I'm not saying, I should be more clear. Obviously, between um, MLK um, and then um, Lyndon Johnson, we did get some legislation passed, let's face it, but it's gotten rolled back uh, by the court, especially voting rights. I mean, reading this, uh, you know, I guess I'm, I'm saying a bunch of things, but to me, the biggest challenge right now is voting and voting rights, because I think t- until until that changes, we can't change policy, but how do we get to that place? Um, and then separately, the question, I mean, I, I, I have Tanahashi Coates in my mind because of reparations, but you maybe have other folks. Ivan, do you have ideas on this? No, and only again, because it's so hard to focus on one person when there oh, are right. so many Good. people doing Good. this work. Um, Thank you. you. Then how about people? (laughs) People. Oh, I mean, everyone who, you know, gets up to protest, everyone who has been, you know, going around for uh, uh, collecting census data, people who literally put their bodies on the line and into motion in order to accomplish a goal. Um, And I think that's something that easily gets lost sight of when we sort of collectively talk about things as you know, one person or even just a, a movement, that movement is made of so many different moving parts. There are always so many different organizations, acronyms that I can't even right. keep track of. Um, but these are all happening in local community grassroots level types of, of action. And we have to remember that it is pervasive and it is everywhere. The progress is slow, but people are working on. You're so right. I mean, my you know, I, my first person I interviewed for the podcast was my friend Dahlia Lithwick, and Lady Justice makes this point. You know, don't just go out and buy the RBG mug. That's not the point. That's she did not want that, and that doesn't help any of us because it takes all of us. Bridget, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with Ivan, and I even think if we look back on. Um, the civil rights movement itself, it, it, you know, you, it, the narrative got control to push people forward. But it was a, a, a lot of people working together who didn't get recognition, who didn't get credit to push things forward. You know, a lot of people that I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement has been global. And even though maybe their trajectory is different or what they're pushing for is a little bit different than than the things that were being pushed for. Um, we have, you know, um, Latino people, Asian people, a lot of groups organizing. And, I, and so I agree with Ivan that, you know, it's 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 everybody working together towards this, you know, one goal, whether it's equality or equity. I guess that would be the question. <laughs> Look, I mean, I think there's just a lot less moral clarity today because we're not talking about, you know, segregation, um, pure segregation, pure de jure segregation here. We're talking about things that are a lot more, I mean, at least to me, ambiguous um, than what, you know, than, than what was what was at stake in 1963. I mean, and then, and then which, which again speaks to that's that's the power of the letter was this context. Um, today, you you know, you, you, there there is nothing, there isn't as much. You know, I, I leave. Let's George Floyd was a perfect example of something that what did have moral clarity because we did see the video and we saw that. But there's just a lot of things when you're talking about um, uh, equality of results, for example. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, there, there's much more to say about that, about, you know, what legal methods should be used mm-hmm. and what equality means in, that, in the context of, of opportunity versus results. Right. Um, I was trying to be provocative there. About, there. Then, <laughs> right. Because, you, know, you know, you're just being your liberal self. It's OK. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's not like lunch counters. It just isn't. Um, and and I think that's part of the problem. I think if there's a problem um, in the efficacy of the method, I think, like, as Jonathan was talking about before, is that you don't have that level of moral clarity. It's kind of like uh, this is totally different because it does involve violence. But Ukraine it's like we've had all these wars, you know, and 
Some of them were, eh, was it really, do, 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 do we, were we really doing the right thing and knocking out Saddam, Saddam to get something maybe just as bad? Or, you know, what, 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 the, you know, with Ukraine, there's just no, there's no, there's no moral, moral, moral ambiguity about it at all. Which is like, it's like you have the just war. It's the perfect just war. And that's what was I can going help on you in out. 1963. I can, wait, I can help you out now, though. What about this? Okay. Okay, this okay. is this is going to be super cool. I think I can do this. So let's. There are moments of what you might call moral clarity. Right. We could say slavery. Slavery. We could say Jim Crow. We could say right. what was going on the de jure segregation. We are right. still living in the legacy between the black wealth gap, how people are treated. We're still living in that, and that hasn't been redressed. I think there's some moral clarity there. Anyway, sorry, Jonathan. What were you going to say? And the killing of our men. Yes. I'll let George finish first. Sorry, George. Well, I, I just think, I mean, the, the, the moral clarity, you know, there is moral clarity in the, what you're talking about, except what's the remedy? I mean, are reparations the remedy? I mean, why should, you know, I mean, okay, so I'm part white, I'm part Asian. I don't think my, what even my white half, had, they, they had anything to do with slavery because they came from, you know, Ireland in the late 18th, late, late 19th century. And I certainly... You know, and, and half of me, my, my, my mother came from the Philippines in the 1950s. So, like, why am I paying? Why would I pay reparations? It's, it, it, you you benefit. it's much you more. Benefit. We benefit from white I, you benefit uh, from this Well, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, again, do you, how do you. But I hear, how, I hear what you're saying. The reality is. Okay, and, and, and everybody, and, you know, in this world of, of where, I mean, frankly, most of us are mutts. <laughs> or at least not. that's the way I view myself. I'm not and a mutt. How do you? I'm, I'm literally like. Okay, well, I'm, then you I'm, pay I'm the like, reparations. There's nothing interesting. <laughs> I'm like 98, 9% okay. Ashkenazi. You're going to write the check. Jew. I'm happy to. <laughs> Our town, by the way, you laugh about this. My town in Northampton okay. is going to yeah. do reparations. I'm glad to participate in that. Okay. Well, but again, you know, it's again, but, but my point is really, it's just a lot harder and there are a lot more counter arguments that are mm-hmm. legitimate moral arguments than they were with, you know, whether whether this whether a, 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 a nine year old girl has to drink from the from a black girl has to drink from a different fountain. I mean, it's just not. But doesn't that get to you, the question of scarce in our society? Why do we pretend there's scarcity when there should be a, a baseline? There should be people's needs. Anyway, this is a separate conversation, but I love that we're even ha- trying to have it, George, and we have to continue this until I beat the truth into you. I mean, nonviolently. Yes. I'm teasing. Okay, yes. Jonathan. No, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. That's what this is. But this is important. I mean, this is. This yeah, is actually, no, I know this. Yes, we should. Right. Jonathan, we're coexisting. Of, you know, yes, as opposed to, <laughs> well, I as mean, opposed to, I feel you know, like bullshit I feel on like, Fox News. I mean, you know. Exactly. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, this is. Right. But honestly, no, this is no, what I wish we were talking about. Right. Uh huh. Jonathan. Right. I also think like, I, I think of all the times where, think about the moments we've had moral clarity about the issues King raised in this letter, right? And how long that lasts. Um, remember that at like Atlanta or Georgia was the first real voter suppression kind of deal there for a while. I mean, there was a lot of it otherwise going on, but all of a sudden everybody mobilized. You know, if you're not going to, if you're going to mess up Atlanta, everybody was saying like boycott Delta and boycott all the businesses that are based in Atlanta. And, um, and they, I, you know, part of this, you know, remember they like moved the all-star game or something like that. I mean, there were all these things happening. And so in a way that lasted like five minutes and then something else came and something else came and then other places started doing voter suppression and then you couldn't even keep up with who was doing it. And so I just think we've also exceeded the capacity almost of the human brain to kind of say, here's a geographical location where one thing is happening because even the things that seem clear cut, um, they just, they just, they don't sit still the way that they did in the sixties. I don't, I'm sure it was really complicated, but there was, there were three ways to get your information from, from media, from networks. And, um, you know, you could think about it geographically. Of course that effaced a lot of horrible things that were happening, but I would just think, I just think of all the moments we've had moral clarity, um, obviously after the mur- murder of George Floyd and things like that. And our society just mucks things up in a way so that, um, so in a way I could not agree more with well, Ivan's point. But our, that, s- our society well, is very complex though. That's wait, 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 wait. I, want to hear, I want to hear how Jonathan sorry. agrees with sorry. Ivan's point. Sorry, George, it's okay. My, sorry, my sorry, point Ivan. is maybe because I've been studying the NRA for the past 10 years, um, that grassroots and running for local 
um, like, you know, you start with the school board and you start with the, I mean, the, for, to the rights credit, like they've been able to mobilize people around Second Amendment and around cl- critical race theory and have angry people showing up to every school board and things like that. They pick kind of three things. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it wasn't just about CRT. It was about taking over school boards and defunding public education. Um, and I just thought, like, where are the 10 zillion liberal people who are going to show up to the school board meeting and counter the angry CRT people in, in a way? And so I just think that I think I just could not agree more with Ivan's point that thinking about um, like everybody's like, oh, we should expand the Supreme Court. We should definitely do that. But we should also like run for school board and election office, a monitoring office and all these kind of things. You know, that ideology of kind of building things from the ground up, I think is so important now, just given given the way we've exceeded, you know, we've exceeded capacity to kind of hold one narrative in our minds for more than five minutes in a way, unless it's, uh, you know, very, very personal. I think that's so important because we can't even have a debate like George and I about like, okay, because we're, even if we don't agree on what next next steps should be, George is willing to, and we're all willing to say, okay, we'll examine the history though. Like, you know, the Homestead Act was only for whites. You know, the GI Bill, when you got, you know, you know, for mortgages um, really was only for whites. Like we can talk about the things that have changed, things that, um, government programs that, for example, help the white community and that didn't help others. That's stuff that's going to be suppressed because of what Jonathan's saying. And, you know, just education. I mean, having a really meaningful conversation about what fair and just reparations would be and who would feel bad about that and why and what, you know, what it means to, you know, as a society, what we want for people. Um, in the society as baselines, all that stuff would be really wonderful conversations that I don't think can even be had if everyone's not exploring the same set of facts. Before we leave, though, because we we have to get on with our lives, even though it's it's very meaningful to have these conversations and think about this letter, I just want to ask um, folks to reflect on um, this one sentence that never grows old um, from the letter: injustice. Anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Oh, that's definitely right. True. We're a community and and we can and we see what men, not literally, but what men, mankind can do. And if it happens to me, right? It can happen to you. Look at what's going on with my reproductive rights. Maybe we'll start talking about your reproductive rights. And strangely, you can also hear an echo of the justifications for U.S. foreign policy and mm. incidents like that. Mm-hmm. Um, it really does cut both ways. Um, you know, is it our responsibility to fight injustice as we see it across the world? Or is it more of our hypocr- uh, hypocrisy to fail to address it in in our own nation. And it's a call for empathy, which is something Mm. that we are losing in our current environment. Um, That was, again, that that was the power of the letter, was that it it was reaching out to the empathetic empathetic core of these clergymen and then of other Americans white Americans, moderate white Americans, and other Americans, and even the people, even the racists. Um, and we don't have, you know, today we've become, too much of our, of American society has become anti-empathetic. Um, we don't want to listen to the other side. We don't, you know, we don't want to hear about the history of it. We don't want, you know, if you're talking about that, that's, that's, I have to have a counter narrative that's not necessarily based in fact to oppose it instead of, of listening. And that's exactly what I think, you know, and, that, and that's the opposite of the gospel, of, of, of the New Testament, of, of, what, of, of the message of Jesus that um, Martin Luther King was trying to spread there. Uh, you know, you have to put yourself in someone else's shoes to understand it. Even if you end up not agreeing on exact methods or, you know, you have to understand where the other person is coming from and you have to, and that requires listening and it requires mm-hmm. rational discussion. And um, what he was doing, what, what, what he was doing through this, through, through these nonviolent techniques was bringing that 
discussion to the table and forcing the discussion to be had on a rational basis, on a nationwide basis, on a worldwide basis at the table. And also just how darn hard that is. I mean, I would invite listeners to try to write a letter like this in the present day, like write a letter to anti-woke crusaders or <laughs> DeSantis or something like that. Like, I mean, we don't, we don't have that skill anymore to kind of humanize, and, and that's by design, right? In, in a way, it's a result of the 60s where, you know, there was a fear of the capitalist system that people would actually bring about change and there would be class unity and things like that. Like our system responded, but just try writing a letter like this in the present day to an ideology that you don't agree with and just see how hard that is right now. I mean, I, I, I'm going to try it myself because I was thinking of it as writing, like, what would it mean to actually try to write a letter like this to like an ideology I completely disagree with to further my own aims, which is what the letter is trying to do. And it, it's almost imp- it's almost impossible. Like either Twitter's ruined us or something like that. But it, but it's really a it's really just the the form of it uh, in light of what George was just saying is is so so challenging to even imagine right now. I feel like I'm so much more cynical because I'm imagining the clergy person I'm writing to is like Joel Olstein, you know, <laughs> someone who I don't believe it, who I I don't actually think is in it for anything other than money. And so, but maybe I could write, I mean, I don't, I, I feel like for some people, I, I don't know, I, I would have to think about, I think it's a great exercise. So I'm going to try to think about doing it, even if I don't. That's my commitment. Um, well, uh, thank you all for, for joining me today. I have a lot to think about, and I'm very grateful for this conversation. Thank you for having me. And, you know, I picked out a good shirt for you and you didn't even mention my shirt. Oh, wait, shirt. wait, wait, we're not Let's done yet. Wait, Let's see. What are you wearing, Bridget? It says black superhero. I love it. Um, okay, so I'm commenting on your shirt, a black superhero. Jonathan's wearing a tie because I think he had a, a more snazzy presentation to do today. George is wearing a button up shirt, no tie. Ivan's wearing no a V neck knit shirt of some type, yeah? Sweater. We've got sweater. We've got three pairs of glasses on the call. George, are you wearing contact lenses? Oh, there's his there's his cheaters. Those are readers, right? Hey, we're five for five now. <laughs> no, these are no, these are these are real glasses. I'm not, I'm not okay, I don't know, and you know, I don't know where. No one, I see no windows anywhere because I'll be. Uh, I know Bridget's in Springfield. Oh, Bridget's in Springfield, George. Are you in New Jersey? Yeah, I'm in Jersey. He's in Jersey. Jonathan, where are you? I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, Tennessee. Ivan, Manhattan or Brooklyn? West Harlem. West Harlem. But how are you cool? in a hotel room, Jonathan? No, I'm in where my office. You're but in your office. I, okay, I'm so in my, letter from a Nashville office. Yeah, but I, I, I had so much stuff behind me, and when I heard you were, I heard you were going to comment. I had to like run and grab all the puzzle papers. So there's like nine puzzle papers on the floor here. Um, oh man, but, you know, I'm sorry. I usually comment at the beginning, but then yeah. I got so excited about the subject matter. <laughs> what I have on the floor here. Oh, that's are you. there dogs? Wait, wait, Corgi. Oh, hi, baby. Ivan has a corgi too. He refuses. To go on screen. Yeah, he's hiding around here somewhere. George, you have a cat also, I saw, no? No, I do not have a cat. Oh, that was a dog. What are you holding up? Is that some kind of tea, Jonathan? No, my only contribution was um, a speaker gave me a bottle of Uzo. So depending on where the conversation went, I thought we could all all have a drink afterwards. Uzo is the best. That would be like Like letter from... Letter from uh, Birmingham Bar or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Letter anyway, from an thank Athens you. Bar. <laughs> oh, that would be great. Well, anyway, thanks, guys. Um, and uh, I'd love to have uh, any of you, you know, obviously my regulars, I always want you back, but Jonathan or Bridget, I may call on you again in the future to talk about your individual work or to join me in the book club. Please. So one thank comment you. here, we, we, ch- we chewed up nearly 90 minutes on a 10-page letter. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Seriously, that's amazing. I could have continued that conversation for another hour, week, year. I think we need to keep having these discussions about the current injustice and where we want to go from here, how to make change. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., let us all hope 
that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. And in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. I'll be back next week with another show as we continue to explore the writing process and the nonfiction world together. Let us know what you think. Send me an email at bookedupatpolitikon.com or write to me at bookedup, P.O. Box 147, Northampton, Massachusetts, 01061. To keep up with the show and our featured authors, follow Booked Up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And please give Booked Up a five-star review. It really will help other people find the show.